it's the 31st of August, 2021. So we see that the days and the nights, they steadily fall away. Each day, each night passes by. And the Buddha taught us to be heedful. And this was the last teaching that the Buddha gave through his kindness, through his compassion. In total, he gave 84,000 teachings that we've separated out into the suttas and the vinaya and the abhidhamma. But if we bring all these teachings uh, together, you can summarize all of them as being heedful or not being heedless. And so we should see that it's normal sometimes um, that different feelings will arise within the heart and sometimes quite lowly moods, quite down moods or uh, uh, feelings of melancholy can come up. And the mind's just not at peace, it's very restless. And in this present day, we may see how there are many people who are going through illness, who are in a lot of pain. Many people are dying. And we find out about this through the news. Uh, so in this day and age, we're not just aware of what happens to our family or those who are close to us, but we're aware of what happens all over the world, that we know that too. And both the things that happen within our own country and the things that happen overseas as well. And so receiving all of this, knowing all about this news, can really stir up the heart, make it very frantic or irritated, annoyed, and give rise to anger or ill will, or there may be uh, feelings of melancholy come up, or there may... Um, even be attraction or delight at some of that news. And so these feelings, they arise because the mind attaches to the sensory experiences that they receive. But in its natural state, the mind is still and clear, just like water that is still and clear. But if dye gets put into that water, if it's red dye, or green, or yellow, or blue, then the water will change color following the color of that dye. But if we separate the two out, and separate the color out from the water, then the water returns to its original clarity. Or perhaps we can see how in a pond or a lake, that if there's a heavy rain, then the water becomes murky. But it's possible to take that water and filter it, and then it becomes clean again. And so we can do that. Um, if we take out the dirty things uh, from the water, then it becomes pure, and we're able to use it and to drink it. Or these days there may be rivers which are heavily polluted, but it's still possible um, to drink that water, to use that, um, because we can create machines or um, filters that are able to take the pollution out of the water. So these hearts of ours, what are they like? That they receive all of these emotions and sensory experiences. And these days people want to know many, many things. But because of knowing all of these things, um, the heart just isn't at peace. It's really um, ill at ease. It's really chaotic. And it becomes entwined with all of its objects, with all of these sensory experiences. So if we find out about, or maybe we are close to people who are sick, or who are in a lot of pain. And it's normal that those people will already have quite kind of down or melancholy moods. So we need to be cautious when we're around them. And we need to accept the truth of old age, the truth of sickness, that these things are natural things. 
and then to bring up our mindfulness and contemplate so that we can understand the Dhamma. And if we contemplate the Dhamma, then joy can arise within the heart and we can be able to accept these truths. But if we contemplate along a lines which is not correct, then it's possible for um, this, these feelings of melancholy to come up. And if they come up more and more, then it's possible for the mind to get depressed. And then it can think about ourselves and think about the future. The future is going to be this way or it's going to be that way. But that's not sure as well. That we have these thoughts in the present moment, the future is going to be like this or that. But it's really uncertain whether it actually will be that way. But what we should do, rather, is to pay attention to the feelings that are there within our hearts. And to bring up a lot of mindfulness and to know these, to be aware of these. So we can recollect this mind, have mindfulness over this mind. And the mind has different thoughts within it, different feelings. It can be very scattered, be full of doubts, be annoyed, or be depressed. But whatever it is, then we know that, we know what's there. And this is the nature of these moods to be this way. And it's not the case that we just don't feel any moods whatsoever, that the mind is always in an empty and uh, peaceful state throughout the day. It's not like that. But what we're doing is we're engaging in this training of the mind. And if we train our minds well, if we contemplate well, um, then joy can arise within the heart. But we need to observe our minds and not just let our minds become uh, mixed up with these sensory experiences and these moods that we're feeling. Because if they do that, then a lot of sadness can arise. And so we see in our present societies that there are many, many people who feel this depression, this melancholy. And so we need to find something that we can recollect, that we can bring our minds to, that bring up a sense of freshness and joy within the heart. So we can recollect uh, Buddha, as the Buddha was, or is the one who knows, the awakened one, the joyful one. And if our minds aren't joyous, it's because they're stuck on their sense of self, they're attached to these experiences that we have. And so perhaps we can find something to do, maybe pick up a hobby, something that brings our minds um, some ease and some peace. We can sculpt a Buddha image or draw a picture, maybe even listen to some uh, music. And so we find a method, a means, to uh, bring the mind some ease. Or we can exercise our bodies so that they feel kind of energetic, refreshed. In the practice of meditation, then we look at and we know the state of the mind. And if our mindfulness is good, then we'll know that oh, right now the mind is depressed. Perhaps we recollect death. We recollect how we must grow old, get sick and die. And then we may think to ourselves, well, what's the point in doing anything? Why should I act? Because I need to die. Um, so what's the point? And I thought this way myself before as well. I'd recollect old age, sickness and death, but this would just bring up complacency. <clears throat> I thought that, well, I'll just wait around for death to happen because I need to die anyway. But this is contemplating in a way that is not right. And that's not what the Buddha wanted us to do. What he taught was for us to not be heedless, to not get intoxicated or complacent. So we need, and what he taught was to find and to walk this path of practice that gives rise to inner peace. So when we're training, we need to have intelligence in that training as well. 
And when we meet with any moods or sensory experiences, we need to have mindfulness there, knowing what that is. Knowing that right now the mind is sad, the mind is depressed. And then we can go and teach ourselves that these things, they're not sure, they change. Ask ourselves, who is it? Who's the one who's sad? Who's the one that's full of doubts? Who's the one that's chaotic? And if we know these things in time, if our mindfulness and knowledge is up to speed with them, then it ends. So there's just arising and ceasing, and that's it. But if our knowledge, our knowing, isn't swift enough, then there'll be a sense of self that creeps in. And then we take it as I am the one who is depressed. I'm the one whose mind is scattered. I'm the one who's full of doubts. And so there's the sense of self. And so we need to come and remind ourselves, to caution ourselves, to teach ourselves that these things, they're not sure, are they? These things, they change, don't they? And we can observe these things. And we can also try to find the external means uh, to relieve these feelings, to ease them out of the mind. Perhaps we can look at some views that we like, uh, go and uh, look at the sea, or go to the countryside, or look at the mountains. Or we can think about the Dhamma or the Buddha, see how the Buddha sacrificed everything for us, so that he could understand the Dhamma. And even though he had to go through so much difficulty, so much pain and suffering, he was still willing to do that for the sake of all beings. And so then, why should we feel down? Why should we feel depressed like this? That the Buddha taught this Dhamma, he taught this path of practice already. So through recollecting the Buddha, then the mind can feel joyful easily. We also need to be cautious um, when we practice, because if we try to force it too much, then this can just make the mind even more unsettled, even more chaotic. Because it's normal that sometimes there'll be peace, and sometimes there won't be peace. And so we need to be cautious around you know, the effort that we use. And maybe our minds just aren't ready for it yet. And so we tell ourselves that these things are just natural. To feel these moods of depression or melancholy, that this is normal, that all beings have felt this way in the past. And even um, some arahants, before they attain to the Dhamma, they had to pass through these kinds of emotions as well. And like the great Arahant uh, Bhikkhuni, uh, Patachara Teri, that she felt the most extreme form of depression, but she was also able to listen to the Dhamma, and then her mind gathered together through that, and she realized stream entry. So she contemplated into the nature of life, and how when we're born, that our lives just aren't sure, that some beings die in the womb, and some die at a young age, some die um, in their youth, in middle age or old age. And through contemplating this, she was able to attain to arahantship. And so she was observing the Dhamma, looking at external things in terms of Dhamma. And she was washing her feet with some water and saw how this water trickled into the sand. So she contemplated this and brought it back within herself and she was able to understand this as a Dhamma teaching. So she went from this state of having such extreme depression to being able to realize the Dhamma. And so it's possible for 
these emotions like this melancholy, depression, to give rise to the Dhamma for us. So we should try to train our minds right here at this point, try to observe, try to know what's going on, and teaching ourselves that the mind is one thing and its objects are another thing. That if the mind attaches to these and becomes interwoven with them, then it's like the water that's becoming mixed in with the dye. So we need to try to know these things um, and for our knowledge to be up to speed with them. And this here is the practice. If we're not able to do that, then we can ask ourselves, well, is this feeling of depression going to last for long? And we can bring up a chant, whichever chant it is that we recite and brings up a feeling of ease, then we use that, and we use that a lot. Or we can contemplate and ask ourselves, well, what's the point in feeling depressed like this? Does it bring me any benefit at all? It really doesn't give us any profit. It doesn't have any substance or core to it. It doesn't give any value to our lives. So we contemplate, and then through this, some things get better. And we can then build up goodness and recollect the goodness that we have done, the generosity that we have done, the things that we have done to support the Buddha-sasana, like um, offering physical things or building um, buildings. And we can recollect the teachings of the Buddha and how he taught us to help one another out and to relieve the suffering that other beings are going through. So in whatever way we're able to give our assistance, then we do that. And then through that, the mind feels joyful in the goodness that we are creating. And the mind here is in a good and beautiful state, because we are ones who sacrifice, who know how to give. So when we live together, then we need to help each other out need to have kindness and compassion for one another. And this gives our lives value. But we don't just abandon one another to, for each being or each person to just follow their own kamma. And in the present situation in the world, if we just do that, if we just allow each being to follow the kamma that they have created, um, this is a kind of equanimity, but it's an incorrect kind of upeka. So we need to help each other as we are able to, following the energy that we have. And then we can recollect the goodness that we've done, and joy arises in the heart. Or perhaps we can recollect or look at a Buddha image that we find very beautiful. And using this as the object of the heart can bring up a lot of rapture and joy as well. And it can allow us to pass through these feelings of depression. So it's just normal when the weather is a certain way, if it's raining very hard for many days on end, or if the weather is very cold and we're not able to go outside, or perhaps we've been ill for a long time, then these kinds of feelings can arise, these feelings of depression. We may think to ourselves, well, why am I like this? That other people my age, or even some people older than me, that they're not sick like this. And so we start to compare ourselves with others. And then this brings up sadness in the heart. This melancholy comes up. And this isn't right to be thinking along these lines. So we need to accept that these things are normal. And we have to accept the normality of everything that occurs. And we're not able to escape from this. It's not something that we're able to flee from. So we need to find a means to 
protect our minds from delusion. And if we're not able to accept the normality of these things and the reality of these things, um, then sadness and um, suffering arises. So the Buddha taught about these four noble truths and how we have to meet with suffering. We have to meet with a body and a mind which is uncomfortable or ill at ease. Or we have to meet with depressed mind states, and this is suffering as well. So why do these things come up? Well, the suffering arises because we attach to me and mine. So we need to train ourselves, and if we don't practice, then we'll never be able to escape from this. We'll die and then we'll get born again and again. So we do need to try to train these minds, and this opportunity that we have now is very good. We've learned about the principles of the practice that the Buddha taught. And so we need to put these into practice to really try them out, um, give them a good go. So just like how some people um, study the kind of knowledge or the, the art of making food, this kind of uh, culinary art, but initially, you kind of don't get things right all the time. They try making a dish, and then they taste it, and then they fix things, they adjust things, and they carry on adjusting it. And as they do that, then the flavor of that dish improves and improves. So our practice is the same. We need to try to train. And it's normal that there'll be... Um, some knowledge there and some delusion there as well. But we try to fix things and improve things. And we also depend upon the instruction of the great teachers. So for myself, when I stayed with Lumpur Cha, that he gave the monks um, many teachings, and we gained more and more of an understanding into the principles of the practice, how to not get involved in liking or disliking, how the mind which is centered and in the middle is on the path to seeing the Dhamma. And so he taught us that when we receive any of these sensory experiences, um, to try to not allow the mind to go into liking or disliking. And then we try to practice, try to cultivate our bharami, and we do this every day. And steadily things get better and better. So we also need to be aware of our minds and to kind of test them or to uh, like observe them and know what's going on. And just like how a doctor may test for illnesses or they may interview a patient uh, to see uh, what illnesses they have, and so it's the same for our minds. We need to test our minds, we need to interview our minds, and know what illness, illnesses are present within them. And then when we're able to diagnose them properly, then we'll be able to find a correct cure from them, for them. And so if we can ask ourselves, are our minds depressed right now? Are they scattered right now? And really it's just these things that aggravate the mind. Uh, this desire for sensuality, this restlessness of mind, or ill will, or doubt, or drowsiness. So we need to know all of these things. And if they come up frequently, then it's usually moha, this delusion that's the culprit for that. So the, there are these three roots um, of greed, hatred, and delusion these three roots of unskillful states. But then there is also the absence of greed, hatred, and delusion as well. And so we should have mindfulness over these things. And then when there's mindfulness, then wisdom can arise. So when we are born as humans, then it's normal that we we'll just have this sense or this feeling of me and mine. 
And when we become aware that our lives must end in death, then those people who have intelligence will devote themselves to practicing the Dhamma. In practicing the Dhamma and cultivating our Bharami, in giving rise to these skillful qualities. So if there's unwholesome emotions that have come up, then we need to try to find something to fix these, to cure these. We can teach ourselves how they're not sure, how they're not me, they don't belong to me. And if our mindfulness gets better and better, then samadhi will become well established, and then wisdom will arise. So sometimes in the practice, our sati, our mindfulness, is very clear. When we're looking at the breath, then we're clearly aware of that, along with the meditation word of Buddha. And then eventually this meditation word disappears all by itself. And we shouldn't try to force it to come back, but we just allow it to be that way, just being aware of the in-breath and the out-breath. And then the breath becomes more and more subtle, But again, we shouldn't try to force it uh, to be the way that it was. Whatever it's like, we just know it as it is. And in the end, there won't be any perception of the breath whatsoever. There's just this inner stillness. And that stillness may gather together at one point. And we just have our mindfulness there, knowing the mind itself. And so this mindfulness may gather together, or the mind itself may gather together in the forehead or at the tip of the nose. And then we know that it's like that, and know that our samadhi has um, reached a certain level. We have this awareness, and if the mind proliferates, then we tell ourselves that it's not sure, this changes. And we're aware of these proliferations of the mind. And perhaps the mind can stay in this peaceful state uh, for a long time, maybe for one or two or three hours. And we're just aware of that, of that inner peace. But also maybe wisdom may not arise quite yet, but we shouldn't be in a rush to bring it about. And just be with that stillness of the mind. And then maybe something just happens. Maybe we see a leaf fall, and then we contemplate and so the unconstant nature of these things, how they all change. And we may just see one form of nature and be able to understand its reality. Just like uh, Patachara Terry, how she was washing her feet and she contemplated into the water. And her mindfulness was very well established. And she created these um, barami uh, for a long time in the past. And so she was able to go from this really deep depression, this level of depression that it's it's impossible to get any more extreme than that. Um, But also when her mind reached stillness and peace, that was a very deep and profound, excellent level of stillness and peace as well. So in no long time she attained to the Dhamma. So this practice, it follows its causes and conditions as well. And we just carry on with it, and one day we may just gain an insight. Perhaps we may be working in the kitchen, and we contemplate into what we're doing. Why is it that I need to cook like this each day? Well, it's because we need to eat. And why do we need to eat? Well, because if this body doesn't get food, then it will be painful. And so we can see the suffering there within the body. And contemplating into the nature of suffering, this noble truth. So therefore we just carry on doing this um, each day, trying to solve the suffering that arises within our minds. We can contemplate um, death and put our efforts into sitting meditation, walking in meditation, trying to bring up our energy like this. And then one day the mind just gathers together, and uh, we gain knowledge, and contemplate into how things are unsure, and wisdom arises. 
And this wisdom, it's an internal wealth that truly belongs to us. The Buddha taught that it's a noble wealth, a wealth that's far away from enemies. And so we see how natural disasters can occur very easily. It may rain for many days, there may be a, a very strong storm that causes a flood, and this flood may last for many days as well, and it destroys people's wells, it may even destroy people's lives. You see how these things, they're not sure, and that's because these things are external wealth. And so it's natural for them to be subject uh, to these kinds of things. But this internal wealth of faith, of effort, of mindfulness, is something that truly belongs to us. So we should use this opportunity that we have to train ourselves. In some days we may be peaceful and some days not, but don't worry about that, just carry on doing it. If there's drowsiness, then put up a fight against that. And don't just be desirous of sleep, of eating, of speaking, of these things that don't really give any benefit to us. And even though the laity may have a lot of work to do, you should do that work with mindfulness as best you can. Try to be as mindful as you can and to fulfill your duties as best you can. And to do them through ethical, moral means. We also need to try to train these minds as well. Because we've been born into this life, and so training our minds gives our lives great value. And we have this opportunity now to um, cultivate our hearts. So we should set our hearts on this. So it's normal that having been born will experience many, many moods. And we should try to put these down, try to let these go. And if we're not able to let them go just yet, then we have to forbear. And we do this every day. And then one day, um, knowledge will arise. So if we're feeling discouraged, if we're feeling like giving up, then we shouldn't just follow that. We shouldn't just allow our minds to become more and more chaotic. And it's very easy in this present day and age with um, what's going on for feelings of melancholy to come up. So we really do need to be cautious about these and see that the mind is just a mind. It's not a being, it's not a self, it's not an other. And so may all of you set your hearts on this. <laughs>